Well, good morning once again. Uh, I see you guys have all found your seats nicely done. Uh, my name is Tiffany, and my husband Elliot and I have the great honor of privilege of being able to pastor this group of people called Lifeline Church, and we love you guys so much. Yes. Um, and then I, I believe every week, we say this every week, but we mean it every week, and I pray about it every week, that you are not here by accident. So whether you're watching online or you're here in the house, God himself has absolutely been drawing you to this place and preparing you to receive a message of love, hope, and encouragement. Every week, the Lord has something for us. Every week, he has something for us in the, middle of, in the middle of our life and on Sunday morning. And so my prayer this morning is that you would receive from Jesus what it is that he would say to your heart. Amen? Yeah. Amen simply means let it be done. Yes, let it be done in my life. That's what that means. So that's why we say amen. <laughs> let it be done. All right. Uh, we are taking a few weeks to talk about habits. It's the beginning of the year. Some people like to, to do things new in the beginning of the year. Not everybody does, though. Um, this is the third week in our series. Uh, the first week we talked about putting God first in every area. Last week we talked about controlling our thoughts. And next week, I'm going to give you a preview for next week, we're going to talk about choose your relationships carefully. And you guys, you don't want to miss this because we, we all have relationships. Um, and we're, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how to nurture, how to restore, how to sever, and how to initiate relationships. Uh, and we need to know how to do those things. So, so you don't want to miss next week. Bring a friend or a family member uh, to come. Um, and at this point, if you guys have the uh, YouVersion Bible app, you guys are welcome to open up that event. We have an event on there. You can pull up the events tab and you can follow along with us. We're going to have all the scriptures up on the screens. And then in your bulletin, if you got a bulletin when you walked in, there's a message insert that has fill in the blank. So if you like to fill in the blanks and take notes, you can pull that out as well and begin to do that. <clears throat> so this series is actually inspired by a quote by a man named Aristotle. Ever heard of him? From way back in, I don't even know what century he lived in. <laughs> He's old. Long time ago. Long time ago. Aristotle. Okay, he's quoted as saying this. We are what we repeatedly do. And then Pastor Chris Hodges, is, and he's actually the creator of this series, he says it this way. We form our habits, and then our habits form us. So the name of this series on habits is called Uphill Hopes and Downhill Habits. Because, this is your first blank, most people have uphill hopes and downhill habits habits. So we tend to have hopes that we're aiming for, but if we analyze our habits, we would probably discover that our habits won't take us to the place our hopes would have us go. Uh, for example, my hope uh, in my brain is to have a warm and inviting home for my family and guests. Uh, yet I have a habit of nitpicking my family whenever the house doesn't look like I want it to. You know, when it's messy by my standards, I have a habit of nitpicking. So I have an uphill hope of this warm, inviting place where you can just be yourself. And then I have this habit of, but get your dirty socks off the floor, you know, uh, or pick up your Legos. Um, and so ho hope is a motivator. It's not a strategy. Hope is a motivator, it's not a strategy. Hope will get you going, but it won't keep you going. Uh, to quote Princess Leia from Star Wars, any Star Wars fans in the house? She says, hope is like the sun. If you only believe when you can see it, you won't make it through the night. So hope is a motivator that gets us moving and stirs us to consider new options, but hope will only take us so far. In order to keep hope alive, we must adopt some habits that fuel our hope. The habits will fuel our hope in the darkness. So we're still going in the same direction, but those habits keep us moving. So the, three, the theme scripture is out of Romans chapter 12. We've been reading verse 2, but I'm going to add verse 1 as well. So here's what it says. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God and you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you and he develops well-formed maturity 
in you. So this series is not intended to be a self-help motivational strategy. Self-help will only take us so far, but God on your side help will take you way farther and way faster. But there's a process to that where we're submitted to the Lord uh, and he, he moves within us. So we're not advocating that you change something on the outside in hopes that your life will change. We're hopefully in this series leading you to a place of understanding that lasting change in your life comes when we set up some habits which allow God the freedom on the inside to change us. So these habits, again, they're not self-help. They're God on your side help. And these habits are still uphill <laughs> because one flare prayer is not going to fix everything. A flare prayer is something that we throw out in moments of desperation or last resort, like, God, I need the rent paid today. I need rent money. Work a miracle. That's a, that's, that's a flare prayer. And it's initiated by the hope that something can be different. It's initiated by the hope that Something can change. Something can happen. There's a God, probably, and he can probably move on my behalf. But that hope becoming a reality is set in motion when we adopt habits that will sustain that hope that, that God can do something. So let's quickly review uh, habit number one. You can go back and watch these online if you miss them. So it was focus on what you do first. So when you look at your calendar, what gets attention first or who gets attention first? What gets plugged into your calendar first? When you assess your time, who gets your time first or what gets your time first? When you analyze where your money goes, who and what gets your money first? Uh, and then habit number two was control your thoughts. Pay attention to what happens in your mind. Filter what you're allowing into your mind. Set up some habits that bring good things uh, that will help negate some of those negative things we see. And then today we're going to talk about this, uh, write this down. We're going to keep my life aligned with my purpose. Keep my life aligned with my purpose. You need to keep your life aligned with your purpose. Um, you need to keep your life in alignment with why you were on the planet in the first place. Um, I've never been to a chiropractor. Anybody ever been to a chiropractor? A lot of you. A lot of you. I feel like I, did, I missed that train. It's not too late. I can get on it. Get on the chiropractor train. Um, so I've never been to the chiropractor, but uh, I, I have... Obviously, I have friends who've been to the chiropractor, um, and, but this is what I've heard, so you can confirm or deny the, what I'm telling you. Um, many of my friends, in telling me about their experience with visiting the chiropractor, tell me that they had no idea their body was as out of alignment as until they went to the chiropractor. When they went to the chiropractor, they realized, oh man, I really was messed up but they didn't know it, then maybe they had an idea, an inkling, but once the chiropractor actually straightened them out, they're like, oh, 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 okay. Uh, once they were straightened out, and then they say this, once they were straightened out, a lot of the pain symptoms that they had had in other areas of their body actually were repaired or went away. So there had been a pain in one part of their body, like their foot or their hand or their arm, um, it, but it was really a symptom of their spine being out of alignment. And once the root problem was fixed, once their spine was, was put back in the right place, the symptoms of pain in other areas went away. Is that true? Would you agree with that statement? So let's bring this back. If your life is out of alignment, you may be feeling pain in a lot of different places. So, and you can try and treat those symptoms of pain or those areas of pain, but if the root issue, like your spine, is not addressed, then the pain may subside for a while with remedies, but it, it's not going to be eliminated. It will return because the actual problem wasn't corrected. So the question is, why is alignment to my purpose so critically important? Write this down. Because I have a purpose. Each and every one of us in this room, you all have a purpose. And until you align your life around your purpose, you will probably experience symptoms of pain in some area of your life. Psalm 139, 16 says this, like an open book, it's talking about the Lord, like an open book, you watched me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I'd even lived one day. So before you even lived one day of your life, God had all the days of your life prepared for you. And when you give the Lord permission and you invite him to do so, he will realign your life back to his original purpose for you. And I, I wanted to address one thing as I was thinking through this. It's possible that you might have experienced a terrible life 
up until now. Uh, maybe some things have happened to you, some terrible things have happened to you. And I, I, want, I want you to, to know that God did not prepare a terrible life for you. God's plan for your life was not a terrible one. Each person on the planet has free will, and most of the world is not submitted to Jesus. Most of the world has not put their faith in Jesus. And maybe some people have. There are some people, who, you know, we've raised our hand in a, in a church service one day, but, but they never actually aligned their life around the purpose of God for them. And so what, what the world looks like is broken, reckless people are all over walking around, and sometimes on purpose and sometimes inadvertently, they bring pain and hurt to the people around them. But the Lord has good things in store for those who love him. That's, that's what his word says, and I believe that. The Lord can redeem even the darkest days of your life if you open up your heart and allow him to work in those places. And I'm not saying that's easy. That's absolutely a process, and we'd love to walk through that process with you because God has a plan and a purpose for you, and the days of your life are good. He has good intentions for you. Ephesians 2.10 says this, We are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You are specially designed to do good works, which God prepared in advance. So this is the thing. God had a thing for you to do first, and then he created you. He didn't create you and then say, hmm, now what am I going to do with Shelly? No, 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 no. He, he had a plan. He had a thing for you to do first. And then he created you. And he said, oh, yes. Oh, yes, I, I have. I have this thing. And I'm going to create this person. And they're going to go. And they're going to do it. And I'm going to love watching them fulfill the plan that I have on their life. So here's a quote. We need to live by design and not by default. We need to live by design and not by default. And this takes intention. To live by design, I'm going to rhyme. Are you ready? I'm going to rhyme for you. To live by design, we must be aligned. To live by design, we must be aligned. Why? Write this down. Because there is competition for my time and attention. I don't know if you know this or not, but the credit card companies have a plan for your life. They want to know what's in your wallet. Uh, more than that, the TV streaming companies have a plan for your life. They want to know if you're still watching. Netflix, anybody? Are you still watching? Okay. Uh, the social media, all the, all the social media apps, they have a plan for your life. Doesn't matter what you clicked on on Google or shopping on Amazon, and now Facebook and Instagram are advertising to you based on all your previous clicks. The world absolutely has a plan for your life. If you let someone else define your life, they will. That's crazy. If you do not decide how you are going to live your life, the world will decide it for you. They will keep suggesting TV shows. They will keep suggesting things you should purchase. Uh, and I think most of us are probably trying to fit too much into our lives. Uh, we're buying too much. We're doing too much. The American mantra is this. More is better. More is better. So if one car is good, two cars are better. If one coffee is good, two coffees are better. If one TV is good, then two TVs are better. If one Krispy Kreme is good, <laughs> ten, ten are better. Ah, ten are better. And that actually, we're, we're in a, a series of prayer and fasting. We're, in, this is, we're two weeks into three weeks of prayer and fasting, and a Krispy Kreme actually sounds delightful right now. It really does. <clears throat> really does. Um, seven more days, everybody. Seven more days. Um, if you, so if you are participating, if you would like to participate in prayer and fasting, it's not too late for you to join us. We're two weeks in, but you can jump in on this last week and just join us in directed prayer. We do have the prayer guides available for you. So on your way out, if you'd like to read more about that or find out about that, you can do that. Uh, and the whole church is invited to participate, but please know that there is no guilt or shame for anyone who's not participating in the 21 days of prayer and fasting. We don't operate like that around here. It's an invitation. If you joined it, great. If not, that's okay too. Uh, but for those are, who are participating, it is very likely that in your time of fasting, you might be discovering that some of the things you've been chasing after are starting to seem a little less important. Here's another quote. An overwhelmed schedule 
will often produce an underwhelmed soul. That's a good one. Let that sink in. So a lot of us have problems. We all have problems. You and I, and we try and fix the problem. But what if I told you that some of your problems are around your purpose and your schedule and your time use? That could be hard to hear. What if some of the problems and the pain in your life are referred pain? Referred pain is stemmed from a problem that's in another place, like with the chiropractor. So if your schedule is out of alignment with your purpose, there will be referred pain and referred problems in your life. Ecclesiastes 4, 6 says this, better one handful with tranquility or peace than two handfuls with toil and chasing after the wind. So just let's think about this. Having two handfuls and chasing after the wind looks ridiculous. Let me act this out for you. Just in case you can't picture it in your mind. Okay, two handfuls. I only have, I have one hand because I have a microphone. Two handfuls. My hands are full. My fists are closed because I have two hands full. But there is the wind out there, which you can't catch the wind. You can't catch it. But that's what our lives look like. We have two hands full, and we're running after something that's just out of reach. But I'm going to get there. And so we've got two hands full, and now we're running after something we're never going to catch because you can't catch the wind. And then if by some chance you can catch the wind, you have to let go of something in order to grab onto something new. Or or you got to take your socks and your shoes off, and you got to use your foot as a hand so you can grab onto something more. And then you're not, now you're stuck. You have stopped moving unless, unless you plan to hobble around inefficiently through life trying to grab onto more. And now we're living, this is not the way you were designed to live, people. (laughs) On one foot with no hands. The Lord wants your hands open. And he wants you to be able to walk freely in this life. Wow! We must be aligned. Why? Write this down because time is short. Time is short on two levels. This will cheer you up. (laughs) The first one is you woke up today, which means you're one day closer to your end. You're welcome. But it's the truth. Okay, and the second, the Lord says that there will be an end. There's going to be an end to the world and the earth and life as we know it. And he says he's going to come, he's going to, he's going to come back to the earth. He's going to come for us. He's going to come for those who have put their faith in him. And the word says, amen. The word says when he comes back, it's game over as far as this life of hustle as we know it. And that day is nearer now than when we first began. We're all on limited time. So there really isn't time to be living casual, ah, we got time, kind of lives, which is how I prefer to live. <laughs> no, not really. But when you stop and think about it, to, to, to live on purpose and to live with intention, it takes habit. It takes discipline. It takes intention. And so it is far easier just to, bah, eh. James 4, 13, that's how you feel on the inside. You just, okay. James 4, 13 through 15 says this. Look here, you who say, today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town, and we will stay there a year. And maybe today, maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. We will do business there and make a profit. I plan to carry on my business, and I'm going to make money. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? The Bible says you are not promised tomorrow. I am not promised tomorrow. Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. Our life on the grand scale of eternity, which is where the Lord lives, is like morning fog. It's like a vapor. It's like a steam when you boil your hot tea, and the, the, or you make your, your, you know, your pot of noodles, and the steam comes up, and then it gets sucked into the vent, and it's gone. It disappears forever like a steam that vanishes after only a moment. Your life is like the morning fog. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or do that. If the Lord wants us to, or if it is the Lord's will. So we don't have time to be casual. There should be an urgency within us to understand the Lord's will 
for my life. I want to I wanna be careful for just a minute here. I was talking to someone last week, and they, they were someone who'd grown up in church. And they grew up in, the, in a type of church where uh, you couldn't move unless you heard God say, Thus saith the Lord. And so they were kind of paralyzed to make decisions paralyzed to move forward with a dream or a passion or an idea because they weren't sure if it was God or not. Uh, and then on the other end of the spectrum, we have people who just, oh yeah, it's the Lord's will. He'll bless it. He'll bless it. It's the Lord's will. He'll bless it. He'll bless it. Uh, and so the, the idea is that we shouldn't live paralyzed um, and then we shouldn't live flippant, God will bless anything I do kind of lives. But this, this, this middle ground where my life is defined by the word of God, and my life is defined by the person of Jesus. And so if I'm in the word, and if I'm in prayer, and if I'm genuinely seeking the Lord with all my heart, I'm going to get it wrong. Ah, you know, I'm going to get it wrong, but I'm seeking the Lord with all my heart. And that, that is the place where that's the Lord's will for my life. Seeking him with all my heart, no matter what I do, and living with repentance you know, Father, I messed up today. I said something I shouldn't have to somebody, and we go and we repent. I'm so sorry, husband, that I bit your head off over socks on the dirty, whatever. You know what I mean? Like those are those are little things in life that that's keeping our life aligned with our purpose. But it's a great. There's a book written by uh, John John Maxwell, and it's called Today Matters, where some thoughts are are talked about about just today, today. So here's some thoughts. What if today is the day they will remember me forever? How then should I live my life? I am going to do the very best that I can do today. Today is all I have. Today is, I woke up today. I'm not promised tomorrow, but I woke up today. That's a great thought to think, to get our lives into alignment. And it's not to be great for the world today but to be great for God today. Because remember, he is the one who has your grand purpose and design in mind. He is the one we live for. And so how then should I live today? Here's another quote. I'll never change my life until I change something I do every day. I'll never change my life until I change something I do every day. A lot of us want our lives to be changed, but we don't want to change to what we're doing every day. Uh, maybe you want to learn a new language or you want to learn an instrument. Maybe you want to further your education for a better job. Those are fine and good things, and by all means, go for it. Absolutely go for it. But start with the God things first. Start with the God things first. I want to help you master the habit of having your life in alignment. So there's going to be four of these. Number one, write this down. Decide what is important. Decide what is important. A lot of our lives are not being defined by the important. They are being defined by the urgent, by someone else. No one on their deathbed says, I wish I had another hour in the office. No, no. Well, I don't think so. Most of the stories I hear from the older generation or anybody on their deathbed, they are usually reflecting back on their life. And they wish they had spent more time with their family, most of the time. Or they wish they had taken more risks and not cared so much about what other people thought about them or the pressures that they were bowing down to. Most of the stories I read about people near the end of their life, that's what they wish they had done differently. They wish they would have just lived life and loved people. So to decide what is important, the key is to know your priorities and then to keep them up front. So the key is don't let your priorities get lost or forgotten. And for each of you, I mean, your priorities can be different. But <laughs> like your car keys. I don't have my car keys. Uh, your car keys. We prioritize being able to drive from place to place, but we misplace or lose the tool that enables us to drive the car. I mean, come on, people. Put them up front. You want to get to work on time. So you, okay, here's the thing. If you prior, so here's the question. Are there tools in your life that you have misplaced? If you prioritize a strong marriage that exists outside of your kids and your career, do you have a date night? Or have you misplaced that? Bowing down to the urgent instead of prioritizing the important. Uh, here's another question. If you prioritize a strong relationship with the Lord, God, 
which acts as an anchor for your soul, do you have a prayer time and a Bible reading time? Or have you misplaced that, bowing down to the needs of the urgent? Philippians 3, 7 and 8 says this. It's Paul, and he's writing to the church in Philippi, and he says, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ. Paul is writing and he's saying, the closer I get to Jesus, the more I realize the things I held as important, they really aren't. The urgent tends to bully us into misplacing or displacing the important. But if you can take a step back and you can assess your life and look at where you're putting your priorities, the urgent things are not as valuable as we have believed them to be. The things that want to dominate our time, the things that make us kind of stressed and anxious, they're not really as important as we think they are. Paul says, I kind of resisted doing the God things because I thought these other things were greater. But once I tried the God things, I found that the God things are surpassingly greater. And church, the only way you're ever going to know that is if you try, if you go all in. You have to go all in to decide which one is better. Number two is, write this down, give calendar time to the important things. Uh, I laugh at myself with this one because it's amazing how many of us have values that don't show up on our calendar. Um, I kind of touched on this a minute ago, but is there time on your calendar for Bible reading and prayer? Is there time on your calendar for your family and for your marriage? You need to fill your calendar with your values before someone else fills it with theirs. And let me tell you that I'm still working on this, but if... I showed my calendar to a few people, and they're like, ooh, a little bit overwhelming. But it's all color-coded, and it's blocked out. And I, there are things that I do every day, every week. They're in my calendar, and they are recurring appointments, and they're for me. They're for me. They're not an appointment with somebody else. They're an appointment for me to keep my life aligned with my purpose. I put it on my calendar, and it's blocked off, and I won't book myself during that, during that time frame because I'm, I'm going to do what's important. I'm not going to bow down to the needs of the urgent. Uh, Psalm 90, 12 says this, Teach us to number our days and recognize how few they are. Help us to spend them as we should. There's something called the rule of five. It's not in your notes, but you can write these down. The rule of five. These are not things that you do all day. These are things that you do every day. Like, um, let's say you lived in the forest. <laughs> and you had a bunch of trees in your yard, and you wanted it to be clear. Um, that's like the five things you do every day is taking an ax and going outside and deciding to take five good hits with that ax and then walking away. Now, dumb question, is the tree going to fall with only five hits? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Will it fall with five hits every day? Mm-hmm you better believe that eventually that tree is going to fall down. Here's the thing. Some of us try and do too much. And so it's the beginning of the year. Some of us get real excited. And we're just going to, we're going to go all the way in, all the way. And this could be with anything in our life. We go outside never having swung an ax and never gone to the gym. And we decide, I'm going to take this tree down today. Well, maybe, but then you'll be near death because you weren't prepared for that, okay? And so what happens is we get, re we get real amped up. We get, our hope is like way up here, and we don't have any habits to sustain it. So it's just, I mean, it's all or nothing. I'm either going to do it or I'm going to fail miserably. And so what happens with no habits to sustain us, we go all in and we go too far, and then we say, nah, that's not for me. I tried that, didn't work. No, 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 no. Just take five small hits every day. That's a habit. Five hits every day, and eventually those things will move. Eventually those things will fall. Eventually something will be built. Uh, so these are five things that, that I do every day. And you can borrow these, you can create your own, but think about if you were to do these things, or what five things could you do every day that would, that would kind of turn your life around, would, would allow the Lord some room in your life. So these are five. 
one of the things I do is I spend time in prayer. Every day, I make sure that I'm talking with the Lord. I'm talking to him about how good he is, and I'm asking him for things that I need in my life. The, the second thing that I'm doing is I'm reading God's word. I'm, I open up the word of God every day, the Bible, whether it's on my Bible app or in my paper Bible, but I read it. And I read it because I'm not going to know what the Lord sounds like unless I know what he's already said. I'm not going to know his, his attitude or his behavior or any of that unless I, I've read the word and I see, oh, this is, this is how God operates. And so I, I know if I'm in line or if I'm out of line with who God is. And then I spend time with those closest to me. I block off time for my family and, and the, the, those who are closest to me. You, nobody can have that time. You can, sorry, you can't have it. It's, it's, it's time with my family. And then I take care of myself. My gym, my, I like the gym classes, and those are in my calendar. You can't have that time. I'm going to the gym. It's good for me. And then I block off. I want my kids to be eating healthy, home-cooked meals. And so I block off dinner time. You can't have dinner time. Nobody can have dinner time because I'm at home, and I'm making dinner, and we're eating dinner together as a family. Nobody can have that time. And then I add value to someone else. I consider who I'm going to see in my day or who I haven't seen in a while, and I think, Lord, how can I add value to someone today? How can I give love and encouragement to somebody else today? So you can borrow those, create your own. But are there, are there five things? Are there five hits that you're taking every day in your life that are habits that are going to sustain you for the future? And then in your calendar, you should have these three things. I'm giving you a lot of information today. Uh, in your calendar, you should have this. Write this down. Make time for renewal. Make time for renewal. You need to refresh yourself. And um, to understand the principle of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is, the, is simply a day of rest. It's one day of rest every six days. God did all of his work in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. And then he blessed the seventh day, and he made it holy. And he said, in six days you shall do your work, and on the seventh day you shall do none. And he blessed it, and he made it holy. Which means if you observe one day out of every six, it will be blessed, it will be holy, it will be set apart. You will be able to do more with your life in six days than you ever could with seven because it's God on your side help, which is way better than self-help. Uh, Second Corinthians, this isn't in your notes, Second Corinthians 4.16, Paul is writing to the church and he says, therefore we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. In essence, it's like everyone around you or things around you are pulling on you, yet you are being renewed. It doesn't matter what's happening around you. If you, that, that's, we take Saturday. Saturday's our Sabbath. We don't do nothing. My kids know it's, they're three and four. When every, every night when they go to bed, they say, Mommy, what are we doing tomorrow? And on Friday nights, it's, well, tomorrow's Saturday Sabbath. We're going to sleep in and we're going to do nothing or we're going to do something. I get to play with you all day. I'm not going to touch my phone. I'm not going to touch my computer. It's Saturday Sabbath. I'm taking a day of rest. And they know that and we guard that and we protect that because it's important. The urgent would tell you that you don't have time for that. The urgent would tell you that that's not possible. But if you take a step back and you assess, it is important. Number two on your calendar, make time for relationships. The most important decision that you'll make after serving God is the people that you pick in your life. And we're going to talk about that ne next week. I already touched on that. But our life groups are up and running. You can find those on the back wall. or There's, there's lots of ways that you can find out about our life groups. But they're open, which means you can jump into a life group at any time and not miss a beat. You're not going to you know, be left behind in any way. And life groups aren't the only place that you can make relationship, but they are a great place to make relationship. Life groups are the place where the big church becomes small and we can make friends and we can share stories and we can laugh and we can cry and we can pray and we can celebrate and just rejoice with each other. And so we do encourage everyone to make time for a life group. Not all of them. We're not telling you to book Monday through Friday night with a life group. That's crazy. Stay home with your family. But pick one. Pick one life group of people who you, who you might be able to connect with and see Commit yourself for eight weeks to the life group quarter and see if it doesn't make a difference in your life. Just see. And then the third one in your calendar is make time for reward. And this is doing something that will bring you heavenly rewards. I want you to look at me, church. You're going to stand before God. Every single one of us, whether we've given our life to Jesus or not, we will all stand before him. That's, that's what the word says. 
And part of my responsibility as a shepherd or as an overseer of God's church is to prepare you to be ready for that day. He's going to ask you two questions. The first one is about the commitment that you made to Jesus. Did you make a commitment to Jesus, and did you honor that commitment? Because he's serious about his son. And then the second one he's going to ask is, how did you leverage the life that I gave you? And he loves us no matter what, but he has a plan and a purpose for our life. It's really important that you live your life to make a difference because we are called as ambassadors. We are called as ambassadors, and you will love it. Can I tell you, when you make a difference in someone else's life, there is nothing else quite like it. My favorite, when I think about my life, I've done, well, I've done some things. I'm only 31. Um, And then there are some things where I'm like, I'm not on track at all. This is not where I thought I would be. Uh, But that's okay. When I look, when I step back and I look at the grand scheme of my life, and there are handfuls of people that I know I'm a part of their story. I know I'm a part of them coming into relationship with the creator of the universe, the creator of their soul. They have a relationship with Jesus because I love them, because I cared for them, because I, whatever I did. And those are the most rewarding things in my life because that made an eternal difference. No one can take that away. No one can take that away. It doesn't matter what happens. And so make time for reward. Make time in your calendar to bring people to Jesus or to share the love of Jesus or to share your story. It's huge. And number three, write this down. This is back to mastering the habit, is eliminate the non-essentials. I'm not going to tell you what your non-essentials are. We've all got them. (laughs) Netflix binge watching. Um, The task is to, uh, uh, whatever. The task is to identify and eliminate the non-essentials. It's simple. And then make a not-to-do list. Eh, We make to-do lists, but let's make a not-to-do list. I'm not going to get on Facebook because five minutes turns into one hour. You know what I mean? It's not the enemy. Whatever. Okay, Hebrews 12.1 says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. Church, I want to tell you that you have permission to live a life that has an agenda set by you based on the purpose of God for your life and not dictated by what others want for you or your family. You need to to know that you have freedom to make your own choices and to to live by what is important based on who God says you are. Amen? Amen. And then number four, this is the, the final one, regularly take inventory. Regularly take inventory. So a moment with you right here. I want you to hear this as well. Wouldn't it be a good use of our time today, church, to stop and say, hmm, where am I out of alignment? Could it be that all these things that are nagging at me and the things that I think are problems in my life may just be because I'm out of alignment with my purpose with who the Lord has called me to be and and where the Lord has called me to go and how the Lord has called me to live. (laughs) Psalm 39, 4 and 5 says this, Lord, remind me how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. You You have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, Each of us is but a breath. And that's not to limit the importance of, you know, our lives and the fact that God did create us and that that God has a plan and a purpose for us. It's kind of this reminder that I am not God. I don't determine the length of my days. I didn't create myself. I have a creator. I have a creator. I have someone who loves me. I have someone who wants the best for me. I am not, I'm not alone in my life. I'm not, I wasn't created out of nothing. I was created in the image of God to live a life that, that is for him. Oh, thank you. Um, I probably didn't tell you something that you didn't already know today, but I probably did remind you, and God wants to remind you 
that our days really are short. And God created us with a plan. He created you with a plan and a purpose in mind. So what I want us to do is to just take that thought. Lord, let me take that thought and get my life in order. And if you do, this will be the most important habit that you have ever created in your life. Because it's the habit of bringing yourself in alignment with Jesus, in alignment with the Lord. And if you can do that, if you can regularly discipline yourself to come back into alignment, that's the greatest thing you could ever do for your life. So uh, what I want us to do is go ahead and pray together. So every head bowed and every eye closed. And what I want us to do is just take inventory. So you can whisper this under your breath, but ask the Holy Spirit to point out areas in your life that need to line up. In fact, let's say that together. Say that with me right now. It's time to line up. And then let the Lord speak to you as your, as your heads are down and your eyes are closed. Allow the Lord to, to show you things or to say some things to you. A lot of times it just feels like a sense. When the Lord speaks to us, it's like I have a sense about something. Or maybe I have an image about something. And that's the Lord speaking to you. And the way to respond to that is just say, okay, God, I sense this. And I'm going to do that. I'm, I surrender that to you. Thank you for showing that to me. And then take inventory of your soul. Are you ready to meet Jesus? And I believe a lot of us in the room are ready to meet Jesus. But maybe there's some of us who have, who have walked away. Or some of us who just have never thought about giving Jesus permission to move in our life. Never thought about the fact that the creator, the person who created me, wants a relationship with me. And he has a plan for me, and it's not random. It's on purpose. And so if that's you, and you, you're recognizing, oh, man, I want that. I want that purpose for my life. Then I, I just want to give you an opportunity to respond. He's looking for a heart that's devoted to him, and he's looking for people who will fully commit to him. And so if that's you, you want to make a decision to do something different. On the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand, and I'd love to pray with you. So if that's you, one, two, three. Three, go ahead and raise your hand up into the air. You want to you want a relationship with your creator. Amen. I see your hands. 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 More importantly, God sees your hand. And he is in heaven. You know what's happening in heaven? The angels are rejoicing. And he is saying, my sons and daughters have come home today. I have a plan and a purpose for you. And I'm going to bring it to pass. I'm going to bring it to fulfillment. You are seen. You are known. Oh, man. Heaven is rejoicing. Heaven is rejoicing. So hold everybody in the church. Just repeat after me. Father God, I thank you for your son Jesus. That he opened up the door for me to have a relationship with you. Father, I thank you that you give me purpose. That I have a purpose. That I am known by you. I am seen by you. I repent of my sin. I repent for living my own way. I want your way. Holy Spirit, lead me, guide me, and fill me. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's join with heaven. Heaven is rejoicing. I wish we could see it.